So first of all, thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited um, to have you all here and ready to kind of chat with our contributors and each other. And before we dive in, we also wanted to provide some ground rules for this session. Um, so I'll run through these quickly. And if you have um, suggestions or comments or questions, feel free to drop this in the chat. So the first, be here now. Um, I know it's, it's hard with everyone being so busy, but um, if you can avoid multitasking and kind of try to take advantage of this opportunity to be here and connect with colleagues. Second, we ask that you share airtime. So allowing everyone the opportunity to speak, especially in our breakout sessions. Third, foster mutual respect, use inclusive language, be mindful of power dynamics, social, professional, or otherwise, and how those might impact the conversation. And lastly, all ideas and questions welcome. We really want this to be a learning space and that is a vulnerable process. So we ask that you assume others positive intent and approach conversations with curiosity and openness. And lastly, before we dive into the good stuff, I'll just give a quick rundown of our agenda today. So we've got our welcome and introduction, and then we'll dive into our contributor panels, and then uh, we'll jump into breakout rooms and small group discussions. And we'll be dividing folks up by institution size, and then we'll come back for a community debrief and closing remarks at the end. So Mandy's gonna drop the link in the chat um, to participate in the Menti, and I will switch over our screens here. Absolutely. So it's kind of nice to have this aspirational thinking, um, you know, as we head into um, how to, to work some creative solutions, right, to solving some of these problems. Um, so thanks so much. Um, feel free to continue to contribute to that. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our um, contributors today. We're going to start off with Cheryl Casey, um, Open Education Librarian at the University of Arizona. And I will hand it over to Cheryl. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, so I started this journey in 2014 and have um, been leading OER through multiple library reorganizations and trying to make OER my primary focus. Um, so started out as a liaison librarian and then in collection services and now in Skullcom. And, um, you know, it, it, I think it's really important to advocate for yourself and, and make the case for why resources need to be devoted to OER and why your library um, could use an OER uh, leader and coordinator. Uh, in the Certificate in Open Education Librarianship, we really encourage people to tie the um, outcomes of OER to your institution's strategic plan and vision and mission, kind of speak the language that your administrators speak, and emphasize the huge return on investment. Uh, my library has a commitment to open um, and is supportive of all things open, but that hasn't translated to a dedicated OER budget or additional staffing. Uh, so, you know, scalability is always a huge challenge. Where can you find that low hanging fruit? Where can you get those quick wins that don't cost a lot of money? Um, I kind of delved into this in um, the starter kit for the, um, or the OER starter kit for open education managers or no OER starter kit for program managers is the title I'll put the link in the chat um and if you can uh advance to the next slide please um I was recently asked to develop a five-year OER roadmap um similar to the action plans that the certificate participants develop for the open education librarianship certificate and um you know we I was asked to set priorities and be really clear about the scope of what we can do and what we can't do. Um, there was a really great 2021 um, proposal, or, or sorry, presentation um, on the power of no, and I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, I We have to say no <laughs> to things when we don't have the funding to do it or the staffing. And so just being clear about what the scope of your OER services are, for me, that means focusing on adoptions rather than adaptations and creations. Uh, we don't have campus-wide stipends for OER creation or adapt adaptations. Um, we have managed to find some outside funding from a corporate donor and an alumnus. Um, so, so being creative about where you can maybe find some additional funding. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, we've tried a couple rounds of the OER or OEN style workshops with the stipends, and I managed to get some uh, one-time money for those, and those were well attended. But when I've tried offering the workshops without stipends, <laughs> the attendance was very, very poor. Uh, so we've switched to offering online learning communities, and that's gone a lot better for us. Um, I know in some of these models, um, you know, they they pay people to participate or they offer snacks. We don't have the funding to do that, so we do it online. Um, but it's it's been a good way to build a community of practice and identify people who are interested in OER that we weren't aware of before. Um, I think identifying those textbook heroes is a is a great strategy that can be low cost to no cost. Um, we feature our textbook heroes on our website, and I'll drop that link in the chat so you can kind of see. Uh, we had our uh, graphic designer develop posters. Um, I love the University of Kansas's textbook heroes program. I'll put that link in the chat too. Uh, I've heard Josh um, Bullock talk about how he writes letters to awardees supervisors. Uh, you know, those kinds of things don't take money, but uh, the awardees can promote these um, awards and recognition in their promotion and tenure dossiers. And lastly, I'll just say that partnerships have been really key for us. We share the cost of our Pressbooks instance with our teaching and learning center, split the cost half and half, and an instructional technologist um, partners with me in the learning communities and co-administers Pressbooks with me. Um, we also meet weekly with our bookstore, which has been a fabulous partner. And so we can do a lot more on a shoestring budget with these external partners and and also looking to your region and state um, for partners and, you know, taking advantage of the OEN services. So I will now hand things over to DRC. All right. Thank you. OK, so um, at University of Alaska Anchorage, I run UAA textbook affordability. And I focus primarily on the adoption of zero cost course materials, though I do provide a little bit of open pedagogy and OER creation support too. So just wanted to give that framework for my program. Um, but I wanna start by giving a brief tour of the history of the program and then share some of my lessons learned, similar to the format of Cheryl's there. Uh, so from 2015 to 2017, the program started in a very grassroots way with three of us, a psych professor, instructional designer, and me, a librarian deciding that we were gonna to try to get the word out about OER at UAA. We literally told everyone at every level and in every way. Um, and in doing so, we started building some relationships with key people on campus. And at the time, the work wasn't in any of our official workloads or job descriptions, we just did it. Um, in 2018, uh, 2019, that was our period of partnerships. So we, and there were two of us at this point, had squawked loud enough and long enough that the vice provost for student success wanted to make textbook affordability one of her key initiatives. And that amplified our voices and gave us some extra support, but not money. Um, so um, we also partnered at the around the same time with our faculty development center to run their year long intensive course redesign program with the theme of transitioning to zero cost materials. Uh, at the time, it was a really well-funded program, uh, so it was a way for us to have a really big impact without actually spending a dime ourselves. Um, the work at that time was in our workloads, finally, but just a tiny bit, and it was nowhere near the actual number of hours we were putting into it. Uh, 2020 to 2022 were the years of the grant. Uh, it was a nearly half million dollar grant from the USDA. Side note here, we were really creative about this grant because that grant program has nothing to do with OER specifically. And UAA doesn't actually have any majors that you'd think of as USDA related. So if you're curious about that, that's a conversation for another time. Um, so suddenly we had a lot of money, but not enough people still. Um, even so, we did some really great, highly impactful things during that period. And that brings us to 2023 to 2024 and moving into the future in which, well, I like to say, honey, I shrunk the program. 
Um, I'm the last man standing from our original team and the program was not sustainable without tangible university support. Uh, and to be clear, there's a ton of verbal support from administrators, but that just isn't enough. I do get about, I should say I do, but the program tangentially gets twenty to $30,000 a year that the university provide, but it is only to be used for an OER adoption award program for faculty where they get $1,000 if they show high impacts for a lot of students. Um, but that funding can disappear at any time. It's year to year. And I also have no say over the use of those funds. And that's the entirety of funding that UA puts towards this. Um, open education work is still an addition to my other job, which is the instructional design librarian. So we don't even have a dedicated open education librarian. Um, no one else at the university contributes any labor to the program other than my little bit, uh, at least formally at this point. And I don't see that changing in the future, near future anyway. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, I want to briefly share the key lessons I've learned over the years. And I love the synergy between Cheryl's takeaways and mine's. mine. I think that means that we're um, on the right track. So maybe. <laughs> um, so my first one here is that relationships and partnerships are critical. If you don't, I think it's critical regardless, but if you don't have money, it's even more essential. Um, so think creatively about the people on your campus that you could collaborate with. So are there any programs with funding that you could piggyback on? Um, maybe it's a student success or DEI initiative or your faculty development center or even your student government. Maybe they have funds that they can put forth. Uh, leverage the relationships you build to get into other people's grants too. So if you can't get the money yourself, you don't have capacity to grant, manage a grant yourself, think about how you can complement others. Um, so be ready to sell them on how adding open ed components will help them reach their goals in order for your program to receive some of the benefits of their funding. And think of every relationship as an opportunity, even the ones with people who aren't jazzed about open. So that vice provost that I talked about on the last slide, well, years prior to her putting our work in the spotlight when she was teaching faculty, she was pretty vocal against OER and discouraged people from using it. So sometimes people come around in a really big way. So every relationship is very important. And um, so the next thing here is supporting and advocating for your faculty. So it's really easy for us and for administrators to get excited about this work. It's also really easy to lose sight of how much work this can be for faculty. So whenever you're speaking about open ed, tell faculty what's in it for them and find ways to reward faculty when you can't compensate them for the extra work. Some of these ideas are going to sound familiar from what just what Cheryl just said, but can you help open ed um, work get into college tenure and promotion policies or help faculty articulate how their work fits into the established P&T policies? Can you write those letters commending faculty for what, they're done, what they've done and CC their deans? Above all else, avoid becoming another person who expects more, more, more of your overworked faculty whether you actually do expect more, 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 or the faculty just think you do, it's not the way you want to go. Um, so make sure that faculty know that you are there for them. And then another one that lines well with Cheryl's is have and set realistic expectations. Could you have a robust and awesome program with no staffing and no funding? Maybe, but you'd be working 60 plus hours a week and you still couldn't do everything that you want to do. So there's only so much you can do with limited resources and be strategic in how you spend your time and any funds you do have and just leave the rest behind. Um, if you are pressured to do more by administrators, push back. You can say things like, yes, we can absolutely do that. And here's what I need in terms of funding and human resources to make that happen. Uh, or I'm happy to shift priorities to focus on that. Can you help me find what's in my workload now that can be removed to make time for it? I think that's a good transition to our next stage here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both um, so much for your, your wisdom and your takeaways uh, that you've shared with us.